joint work with Philippe Robert, so INRIA and the talk uh, uh, and Collège de France. And the talk uh, is uh, on the spontaneous dynamics of synaptic weights in stochastic models. Gaëtan, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks. So I'd like to thank uh, the organizer for uh, inviting me to talk in this symposium. Uh, and so I will briefly present uh, some work from my PhD, uh, which I'm doing with Philippe Robert on uh, the implementation of uh, spike timing dependent physicity uh, in uh, stochastic models of neurons. So uh, I'll go quick on the introduction because everyone here, I guess, know about neurons. So uh, in my work, we only consider a simple system where we have uh, a single neuronal cell, uh, which is connected to a second one, so the green one, through a single synapse. Uh, so it's a really a minimal system to study the influence uh, of uh, plasticity on this synapse. So I will just uh, remind here that we considered that the information is going uh, in uh, uh, unidirectionally. So it starts from the presynaptic neurons, uh, goes through the synapse, and then go to the postsynaptic neurons. So I will use the term presynaptic neurons and postsynaptic neurons in the following of the talk. So the information uh, goes through uh, spikes, uh, which are uh, initiated in the first neuron, the presynaptic one. And then at the synapse, it gives uh, place to a rise of the postsynaptic neuron membrane potential, so a short rise, uh, which can afterwards uh, lead to a, a spike of the postsynaptic neuron that is then propagated to uh, the rest of the system. So we are interested uh, in our work uh, uh, about a synaptic plasticity, which is the modulation of uh, the influence of the presynaptic spikes on the membrane potential uh, jumps uh, at the synapse. So for example, here I represented a potentiation, which is uh, an augmentation of the jump size uh, after some uh, activity dependent process, uh, like the one that has been presented just before by, uh, by Christine. Uh, and so it is quite known that uh, this is the basis of learning and memory uh, in the brain. So uh, our approach, uh, is uh, at the junction between three different domains. So uh, firstly, uh, we use uh, experimental data uh, from uh, uh, neurophysiology, uh, so from uh, my lab at Collège de France, uh, about STGP uh, in vitro and in vivo. Uh, moreover, there have been a lot of uh, computational and neuroscience study uh, on the role of uh, STGP in numerical networks, so both uh, bifurcation analysis, but also just computer simulation and uh, more complex networks. And finally, uh, we use the fields of probability uh, to study uh, rigorously uh, how does STGP uh, evolves uh, in stochastic neural networks. So up to now, there have been only, uh, uh, I, mean, I mean, in the probabilistic uh, field, uh, stochastic neural networks have fixed weight. And so our goal is to implement a stochastic neural network with uh, weights that are modulated uh, by the network's dynamics. So that's uh, what I will present today. I will present how we implement STGP in a stochastic setting, and I will present results on pair-based models uh, in the case. So I'll start by uh, the general framework uh, for STGP that we have defined. Uh, so to go back to our simple system, so with just two neurons and one synapse, uh, we represent the presynaptic neuron by uh, an homogeneous uh, Poisson uh, neuron, so whose spikes uh, are represented by the jumps of a Poisson process with a fixed and homogeneous rate, which we call lambda. This leads through an integrate, uh, a leak integrate dynamics to this uh, kind of uh, membrane potential traces, so which is just the, the convolution of the presynaptic uh, spike train with an exponential kernel. So we don't use any reset or uh, other uh, properties of internet and fire neurons. And then, uh, and so the jump size uh, in the convolution is what we call the synaptic weight. So it will be the value that is modulated by synaptic plasticity. We call it W. And so the postsynaptic spike train uh, is modeled uh, by uh, again, a Poisson neuron, but this time the, its rate uh, is proportional to uh, the membrane potential X, which is uh, the yellow trace. So in mathematical term, uh, what we call the so, uh, 
saying that the presynaptic neuron uh, is an homogeneous Poisson process with rate lambda, it means that if we just uh, take the probability of having a spike in a small uh, time interval uh, delta t, uh, the probability is, is uh, equal in the limit of delta t going to zero to lambda time delta t. Then to model the postsynaptic membrane potential, it's just uh, a short noise, an exponential short noise of amplitude lambda. So it's just, uh, it follows uh, the following dynamics. So it's almost the same than in uh, the leaky internet and fire uh, uh, model. And so the postsynaptic spikes, uh, the probability of having a postsynaptic spike in a small uh, time delta t uh, is equal to beta, which is the activation function. Uh, usually an increasing function of the membrane potential x at time t. So like this, the higher the membrane potential, uh, the, more probabili probabili the more probable it is to have a, a spikes of the postsynaptic neuron. So then how do we model synaptic plasticity? So it's the new, uh, the addition we have done. Uh, so plasticity, synaptic plasticity, uh, as was explained also before, uh, there are many models, and uh, one that is really used uh, in computational science is STDP, because it's only based on the pre and presynaptic and postsynaptic spikes, which is really then easy to implement uh, either in uh, uh, mathematical analysis or uh, in computational works. So like, this is a classical uh, Abian curve uh, from uh, B and Boo, uh, B and Boo uh, work. So here you have a uh, delta of t, which represents the timing between the postsynaptic spikes and the presynaptic spikes. And here are uh, relative uh, synaptic changes uh, after a protocol of several pairings. And so here you have on the right, so it corresponds to when you have a presynaptic spike that is followed by your postsynaptic spikes, you have potentiation. And here on the left side, which corresponds to a delta of t negative, so it's uh, the anticausal pairing where the postsynaptic spike is before the presynaptic spikes, you have depression. So starting from the, these classical uh, experimental curves, uh, we just take an exponential model. So where we model, uh, so as you see, we just uh, fit uh, uh, an exponential curve. So with two parameters, the, the, the decay time and the amplitude at zero. And then we want to model, to add uh, this to our model. So here I represented uh, one presynaptic spike and five postsynaptic spikes. Which is below, and so how do we update our synaptic rate, which is uh, which is which is below? Uh, we just update at each postsynaptic spike time, so t post, so the green one, uh, sorry, the purple one, by the sum over all previous presynaptic spikes. So here there is only one, so we have two terms in the sums uh, of the quantity b1 over uh, exponential minus gamma one t post minus t pre, which corresponds to the red dots that you have here. So it gives us this sum, uh, which can be modeled through uh, the following shot noise processes. Uh, so Z1 uh, is the sum uh, of uh, B1 exponential minus T minus T pre. So it's a stochastic process uh, that at each uh, presynaptic spike, so the green one, is raised by the value B1 and then decays experimental, experimentally sorry, uh, by the value gamma 1. So gamma 1 is a uh, I've been forgotten here, but uh, it should be here. Uh, and then we update W at each postsynaptic spike time by the value Z1 at time T post. So it gives the same equation. It's just a more convenient way to represent it in terms of uh, Markov, Markov processes. And so here is the differential, uh, the stochastic differential equations associated. So the first one is just a classical short noise, short noise processes. And the other one, it just means that at each spikes of the postsynaptic neuron, we update by the value of Z1 just before the spikes. We can do the exact same uh, analysis for the other side of the curve, so the blue one. So at each presynaptic spike T pre, so the green one, we update by the sum over all previous postsynaptic spikes, so the three purple ones that you have there by the quantity uh, B2, which is uh, the amplitude at zero, exponential minus gamma 2 T pre minus T post. And so again, we have the same representation in terms of stochastic differential equation. And so all in all, this gives us a simple system of three stochastic differential equation. So the, the first one, which represents the activity of the presynaptic neuron. The second one, the activity of the postsynaptic neurons integrated on the time scale. And a final equation where we have the update of the synaptic weight in terms of this value of Z1 and Z2. 
So here I presented uh, the all to all implementation of STDP, which means uh, at each spike, I just took into account all the previous spikes of the other neurons in the sum. There have been a lot of work to compare and to try to find the best way to, to model STDP. And so other implementations have been developed, uh, one of those being, for example, the nearest neighbor uh, symmetric uh, implementation, where uh, for each spikes, we just take into account the previous one. So as you see, I have lost two terms in my sum because these two ones uh, are not taken into account anymore. Uh, and there is also a more re restrictive one, which is the reduced implementation, where we only take into account consecutive pre and post pairing. So which means we don't take into account uh, this one because uh, there is a postsynaptic sp spike between uh, the previous presynaptic spike and the current spikes. So we only have two terms in this final implementation. And so we can also, by the same tricks as I explained before, represent this process uh, with more complex system of stochastic differential equation, which I won't present here. Uh, just let's say that they exist and that we can show that they are equivalent. So what we have done in our work is to suppose, uh, to make a, an hypothesis that has been used by most computational neuroscience uh, article on this subject, which is that there are two time scales uh, in STDP. There are fast processes, uh, which are on the time scale of milliseconds, uh, which uh, are mostly the time scale of the membrane potential dynamics and of the correlation uh, in the STDP curves. So that's the one uh, Christine also presented before. So a very restrictive one around 50, uh, 20 to 50 milliseconds. So it's really, uh, really short. The other processes, which is updating of the synaptic weight, so the, the characteristic uh, amplitude of change of the synaptic weight, uh, it takes uh, more times because protocol, for example, they do uh, a protocol on uh, about like one minute, and then we have to wait for at least five to 10 minutes to see uh, a significant change appears. So uh, the changes uh, in W can be characterized as slow. And so what we can do, what we do in mathematics when we have this kind of two uh, timescale system, uh, we use the scaling parameters to uh, uncouple uh, these two systems. So that's what, that's what we have done. We have developed uh, a formalism uh, and introduced uh, this uh, limit epsilon uh, when epsilon goes to zero. And uh, I will just present the stochastic averaging principle that we have approved, and then I will use it uh, in an example. So uh, what we can imagine is that as the synaptic weight W is evolving really more slowly than the neuronal dynamics, is that we can suppose that the neuronal dynamics uh, happens uh, with the synaptic weight fixed at a fixed value W. And then we can study uh, so this uh, stochastic differential system uh, with a fixed W. And we can study uh, the equilibrium uh, if it exists uh, uh, and what's the property of this equilibrium distribution. So we can prove that for simple system like this, which are just like a, a multidimensional short noise processes, uh, the invariant distribution exists and that it, the system converges to the distribution uh, really quickly. Uh, so I will uh, note by pi of x, uh, the, the invariant distribution of this stochastic system with W fixed. So the indices W here is for the value of W used in the system. And X can be either of the three uh, schemes I presented before um, uh, to implement a CDP. And so the idea is that uh, when we look at the system from the point of view of the slow variable, so W, uh, the system has the time to average over itself because the neural dynamics are going really more quickly than uh, synaptic weight ones. And so uh, we have uh, the following uh, equations in the limit of epsilon going to zero. So I will present it. So firstly, for some so for mathematical reason to avoid any explosion in our system, uh, our proof is stated with the existence of a, a finite or infinite uh, horizon S0 which represents the time on which uh, the limit system is defined. Uh, so we have proven that uh, there exists an S0, which can be finite or infinite, uh, where uh, the stochastic process W of epsilon uh, is tight when epsilon goes to zero. So we 
compact uh, in topological term, uh, for the convergent distribution, and that any limiting point, uh, small w of t, uh, satisfies the following equation. It's kind of what we could expect from intuition. It means that uh, the synaptic weight uh, is equal uh, to the integral over um, the invariant distribution of the quick system at a w fixed of uh, a terms, uh, polynomial terms, uh, in a way, of Z, Z1, Z2, and X. And so what will be interesting for us is that uh, with the simple system I presented you before, we can compute uh, this and have uh, an explicit uh, equation uh, in the limit uh, of epsilon going to zero. So uh, I will now present the result for a really simple uh, case where the activation function is taken as linear. So the form is like nu plus beta times x. So nu represents external output and beta times x will represent the, the spiking process due uh, to uh, the presynaptic input. And so to, uh, to study how uh, the system uh, evolves in the limit of epsilon going to zero, we will need to study the functional that I presented before, which is the integral over the inverse distribution of this term. So we will be able to compute it for all the model I presented, and then to study uh, uh, the, the dynamics of the equation. And so I will also present simulation uh, for different types of STDP curves, uh, and do a bifurcation analysis. So for the first model, uh, uh, we, the, the computation of uh, the, compl the, the function f uh, leads uh, to a really simple uh, equation where we have the derivative of w, which is equal to uh, just uh, an affine function. So where we have like a term multiplied by w plus a constant. So uh, the terms be before and before, that depends on the constant of the model. So I rem just remind you, b1 uh, is a pre-post amplitude, b2 is a post pre-amplitude, gamma1 and gamma2 are the time constant of STDP. Uh, and so we have just some terms like uh, or like this. Uh, and so from this equation, uh, we have two possible uh, behavior when nu, nu is equal to zero, which is the case where we have no external input. Either the system is positive, uh, no, sorry, is negative. And in that case, uh, we just have the derivative uh, being a negative function. And so uh, the W converge to zero uh, when the time is going to plus infinity. So that's what we have here. I just plotted some simulation with different epsilon to show you that uh, when we have uh, a curve where uh, the term lambda one plus lambda two is negative, we have convergence to zero for asymptotics. Then if we have a positive uh, terms below, we have the other uh, situation. So W diverges to plus infinity uh, when the time is going to plus infinity. So I just represented here like a, a summary of this, where we test all the value of B1 and B2, and we show that if we are below uh, the dotted line, we have a depression, so the synaptic weight is going to zero. And if we are above, we have potentiation, so the synaptic weight is going to plus infinity. It's kind of a simple behavior, and it's not very interesting because we what we want to have are stable fixed points or unstable fixed points to have more complex dynamics. And so to do this, we just have to add an external input. If we add an external input, this term is not zero anymore. And so uh, depending on the sign of uh, delta one, uh, lambda one, sorry, uh, we can have either a stable fixed point like this, so where we have convergence of uh, our synaptic weight to uh, a, a positive value uh, at high times. Or uh, if we just reverse the sign, we can have the other way around. So we can have an unstable fixed point. So if we start below this fixed point, we go to zero. If we start above, we go to plus infinity. And so here is like the summary map uh, where uh, we can see that we have two small regions. So between the dotted lines and the plane lines, uh, if we are here, so in green, it's stable fixed point. If we are below uh, in orange, it's an unstable fixed point. And if we are outside of these two, we just go back to the simple behavior as before, which are uh, convergence to zero in blue, or divergence to a plus infinity uh, in red. 
So now if I go to uh, the second model, so the nearest neighbor symmetric pair based rules, so it's the one where we only take into account the last spike of each, uh, sp the last spike uh, in the sum. Uh, in that case, the computation is more complex because it's not as easy to, to do the, the computation. And we have a really more complex function, so the dynamics is not as easy to study. But still, we are able uh, to prove that we have the following uh, map where again, we have four zones, uh, one of LTD, so where we have only a convergence to zero, which is again in the same region as before, LTP, and we have a stable fixed point zone, which is way larger than the one uh, I presented before, which was like this, way large, larger, and the same for the unstable uh, fixed point. Uh, so this was done for no external input, and if we had an external input, it's kind of the same, doesn't, we really don't have much changes. And finally, what's interesting is that if we look at the last model, which is so the reduced one, where we only take into account consecutive pairs of spikes, uh, we have a switch of uh, stability, which means that where we had before uh, stable fixed points, we have uh, unstable ones. So it's just uh, like the orange ones, and my figure is not really detailed, but we can prove that we have, in the, if we are close enough to the plane lines, we have the existence of an unstable fixed point. And so, symmetrically, uh, in these uh, regions, we have the existence of a stable fixed point. So, it's really interesting uh, because um, in many computational studies, uh, all these pairing schemes are used without uh, any uh, justifications. And here we show that in the limit of low external inputs, so when we have uh, small external inputs, uh, there is a strong impact of uh, the pairing schemes on the dynamics of a single synaptic weight. It can lead to either a stable or unstable fixed point, depending on which scheme we choose. And it's kind of important then when we want to study afterwards dynamics of uh, neural networks, uh, to when we do this uh, uh, choice of pairing scheme to justify it and to have in mind that it can lead to just to uh, opposite behaviors. What we have also showed is that if we add uh, a significant external input, then all pairing schemes are equivalent in the sense in the in the sense that um, the um, uh, stable and unstable fixed points happen in the same regions approximately. What we have also shown is that to have a stable fixed point, so we need anti-Abian STDP, which is not the most uh, well-known one. So where we have depression on the pre-post sides and potentiation on the post-pre sides, whereas Abian STDP leads to unstable fixed point. So many studies have been done uh, on STDP in networks, but mostly with Abian STDP. And so it will be interesting to study uh, how anti-Abian STDP evolves in more complex networks. And so to finish, uh, I will just say that uh, we have also done this work for inhibition. So like I presented like uh, here with positive uh, synaptic weight W, but we have also done it for negative ones. And so the situation is reversed. Uh, and we are planning to extend uh, this model to multidimensional multi uh, models and to study the plasticity uh, in uh, complex neural networks. And we also plan to do some uh, limits for large network uh, with mean field approximation. So these are the associated papers uh, which are in my PhD and so I thank you a lot for your attention and uh, I'm standing by for any questions. Uh, thank you Gaëtan for this uh, very interesting talk. Uh, I'm looking at the chat, I don't see any uh, burning questions so far. Uh, could you perhaps tell us a, a little bit more about uh, the mean field approaches that you're you're considering and perhaps the kind of scalings that uh, would be appropriate you think yes yeah, so it's just like really preliminary works uh, what we are thinking is that uh, we may not go uh, as many other people have done which means by uh, taking the mean field limits on the presynaptic inputs because usually what people do is that they uh, still keep like a feed forward architecture with many presynaptic inputs and one presynaptic uh, output, and they do the mean field limit uh, on the presynaptic uh, inputs. Uh, uh, but we, I think we will more go to the situation where we have many uh, 
postsynaptic neurons and do them in field on them. And to do this, we will just scale the, uh, the interaction between uh, these postsynaptic neurons because we will have an infinity of neurons and uh, they need to be connected. And so we will uh, scale uh, by one over n uh, their interaction strengths. Okay. There's a, there's a question on the, on the chat by Sven Goedeke. Uh, very interesting, he says. Uh, can you also say something about the fluctuations of the weights or the weight? So we haven't done any uh, central limit uh, theorem on, uh, on our convergence uh, processes uh, yet. Uh, because uh, because we haven't done it, but uh, I guess we could expect that in some limit uh, it scales back to a uh, Gaussian uh, processes. But uh, I'm not sure which limit, and uh, I don't want to say any uh, missed many wrong things, so I won't say much more. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, I've lost the chat. Um, <clears throat> there it is. Uh, Yes, uh, Abe Maquet, to um, any intuition on the diffusion between the symmetric and the parasymmetric to see when the switch happened between stable and the unstable regimes? So uh, we don't have like a continuous parameters that goes from uh, the, the symmetric model to the reduced one, but I guess we could try to find one and to study more precisely uh, this switch. Uh, this is a really good question and I would be really interested in doing this because I think it's really important uh, to have this in mind. Uh, but as I said, we also have a switch uh, when we rise uh, the external input, uh, but this will be easy, easy, more easily studied uh, and we are going to do it uh, in the publication, I guess. I mean, is it, is it just because like in the symmetric one, you include every one, every every spike after the um, the green spike. So in the post-synaptic ones. So basically, if you reduce the neighborhood, uh, maybe this is how you can make your diffusion, make it continuous by reducing the nearest neighborhood on the post-synaptic one. Copy. Yeah. No. Anyway, just. Uh, I don't see how I can have a, a continuous. Uh, continuous parameters to scale from the symmetric one to the post to the reduced one. But if you have any ideas, uh, I would be uh, happy to talk about it uh, in the chat or uh, or even later by email. Okay, well, that's a starting collaboration, perhaps uh, with Abed. Uh, <laughs> if there aren't any uh, more questions, uh, I will thank uh, thank the speaker.